the Spot Track Podcast, talking sports contracts, the salary cap, and business of sports. Welcome to the SpotTrack.com podcast. I'm Kevin Sylvester, along with Paul Peck and the founder of SpotTrack.com, Mike Gennetti. Busy week for you last week with the NBA, and now we got the NFL going on here, Mike. But we've got a special guest to talk about uh, how these things work uh, behind the scenes between teams and agents. Yeah, we sure do. We're uh, real excited to have this guy on. He's uh, obviously a big name on Twitter in terms of NFL and, and, and the numbers. He's a guy that I've followed. He's kind of a mentor for me going along here the past couple of years, so really excited to have him on. We're going to speak to Joe Corey here. He's a former sports agent, sports agency founder, and resident capologist in terms of uh, Twitter and, and lots of CBS.com articles and things like that. So, uh, Joel, welcome, and thanks for uh, joining us today. Thanks for having me. Joel, give us a, a very brief kind of overview on, on the evolution of your career and uh, maybe some of the prominent people that, uh, that, that you've had a chance to work with over the years. Yeah, I started interning for Leonard Armato after my second year of law school at UCLA. Um, was able to turn that into a full-time job when I got out of school. Um, at the time, he was representing Ronnie Lott, Hakeem Olajuwon, and signed Shaquille O'Neal at that time. So I got to work on a lot of things with pretty prominent players. Leonard didn't have a real interest in building the football practice, wanted to maximize Shaquille. I was helping another agent build up a football practice. Um, a few years later, we had the most amicable split you'd ever see in this industry, where <laughs> Leonard wanted no ongoing interest in the football players. We still shared office space for another couple of years. I still was a consultant for Leonard on Shaquille Matters, and we built up a football practice at Premier Sports and Entertainment, which included Pro Bowlers Jimmy Smith, Keenan McCardell, Hall of Famer John Randall, Willie McGinnis were among some of the clients. I got kind of burned out on the whole sports agency business and got out of it about 10 years ago and then kind of figured out maybe I should do something with all the knowledge I have and turned it into um, some sort of semblance of a media career where I'm now writing for CBSSports.com regularly, a column called an agent's take, which focuses on contract and salary cap issues for the NFL. Well, I, I know all the fans and other fellow media members we appreciate you writing that but i know the commissions are probably much less writing for the <laughs> oh yeah yeah totally different, totally different. <laughs> but so is the aggravation level right uh yeah because when someone would ask me what i did for a living when i was an agent i'd jokingly say professional babysitter so i don't have to deal <laughs> with some of the uh aggravations that certain clients can give you some are more time intensive than others and high maintenance so that's no longer a part of my life <laughs> he's happy i you know before we get to some serious questions here do you like the show ballers do you watch that at all with the rock i just find that funny all, all the scenarios they go through being agents yeah i do watch it the interesting thing to me is the financial advisors are really day-to-day -day guys, and the uh, actual contract agent really doesn't do anything except the contract, and that normally isn't the case. It's normally the contract agent is the day-to-day -day guy and the point person, and the financial advisor is more on the periphery. Interesting. Interesting look. All right. Uh, okay, so now we know you're tuned into everything that's going on in the sports world, so Mike has come up with some interesting topics, all of them timely, that we're curious to get your expert agent's take on. So, Mike, go ahead and let's get rolling here with Joel. Sure. So, uh, so Joel, right off the bat here, obviously the, the big name the last few weeks here is Nick Foles. Uh, we've kind of sp spoken to him here uh, past few episodes, really, just kind of our thoughts on how things might hash out. So really, we're just looking for what you're thinking here. We've got a Super Bowl MVP. We've got a, a guy with make, making about $7 million next year with the Eagles, pro prominently as a backup, but who, who knows with this Carson Wentz situation. If you're Nick Foles' agent, what are you saying to him right now? Well, he seems to be not quite your typical player since he was contemplating retirement before Andy Reid called him after things didn't work out with the Rams. He doesn't have a ton of control in the situation since he is under contract for the 2018 season. Uh, if he stays in Philadelphia, which is what I would do if I'm the Eagles because I'd rather err on the side of caution with Carson Wentz, the timetable for his retirement recovery is nine to 12 months. I don't want to push it and let him take as much time before we know he's comfortable to come back and play and give him the time off. 
he's probably not going to be the Carson Wentz that we saw when he got hurt initially. I would, unless someone blows me away, knocks my socks off of an offer that I can't refuse, I'd hold on to Foles at least until the beginning of the season and maybe revisit it at the trading deadline if Wentz is back on the field and playing the way he used to play. What, in, the, in the black and white, grab every dollar world that is both agents and teams, would there ever be a scenario, Joel, in this where the Eagles, um, assuming they could get an adequate backup in there, would actually go to Nick Foles and say, hey, as appreciation for everything you've done here and winning a Super Bowl for us, we know you want to start somewhere. We're going to give you that chance to t- to send you somewhere to start. Is that ever a possible conversation? Teams put that nice. They don't do things which are in a player's <laughs> best interest unless it's also in their best interest. They're not just go, hey, Nick, you got us a Super Bowl. Uh, we know you want to start. We'll, we'll help you pick a team in a landing spot. <laughs> no, they, they know they've got – the, an ideal quarterback situation, less than $15 million of cap space tied into the two quarterbacks. And you know what Foles can do in relief. I'm not going to upset the apple cart unless someone blows me away. And to me, blow me away is kind of what Minnesota gave up for Sam Bradford, a first and a fourth. I don't see any team doing that unless they become extremely desperate because of a training camp in- injury. But Unless you know for sure which is way ahead of schedule, then you don't really deal foals. And then once you once the fifth day of the league year passes and you've paid that $3 million roster bonus to him, you're going to need more compensation because it becomes cheaper and you have an additional cap cost uh, if you get rid of him. So if he's going to get traded, it's probably going to be by March 18th. To me, but I don't really see that happening unless someone, maybe Minnesota, since the, his former quarterback coach is now their offensive coordinator, that would be the most likely destination to me. Let's talk about Kirk Cousins. And, you know, he, he was going to be the quarterback that started everything, but it looks like Alex Smith was that guy, um, you know, being traded to the Washington Redskins. So Kirk Cousins is going to be out there, right? I mean, they. I, they theoretically could trade his rights, but that doesn't seem likely because of the franchise tag. But just tell me your take on Kirk Cousins, what's happened the last couple of years with those franchise tags, and where do you see him landing and for how much money? Well, he's ended up playing this perfectly, whether by design or by accident. The Redskins have created the blueprint for how not to keep a good quarterback. <laughs> Let's lowball him, never raise the offer, franchise him, still never give him an offer which makes it interesting for him. At least they decided to cut their losses, presumably, that they don't go through this franchise tag shenanigans and got probably the best replacement they could, given what they were working with in Alex Smith. Um, Like it or not, at least in terms of pure raw statistics, Cousins compares very favorably over the past three years with the high – the guy who was the highest paid player in the league, Matthew Stafford, and also Matt Ryan, who's in line for a new deal. He's like fourth in completion percentage. He's like uh, sixth in passer rating. He's averaged like 4,400 yards, 27 touchdowns, and 12 interceptions over the past three years as a starter. And I think this year, even though statistically it wasn't as good as 2016, it may have been a better season given he lost his two starting receivers to free agency. The offensive line was decimated by injury. He lost his tight end, Jordan Reed, for a good portion of the year. Every running back they had ended up getting hurt, and he has a suspect defense. You can't you can't ask Kirk Cousins to carry a team. He's not that guy. But you surround him with pieces, I think you can win with him. Because of Jimmy Garoppolo getting a deal averaging $27.5 million per year, um, I know average salary is the sexiest, at least for the public, in terms of metrics, but not the most important. That lays a framework or a foundation for the floor that Cousins will ask for in free agency. I think that since he is a quarterback who is good, healthy, and in his prime, presumably going to hit the open market, he's going to become the highest-paid player in the league, at least temporarily. It would not surprise me 
if he gets close to or hits the $30 million per year mark, maybe $100 million overall guarantees where 65 is fully guaranteed at signing. But by the time the regular season starts, if Kirk Cousins does become the highest paid player, he still won't be it. Where's he going, Joel? Where do you think? Give us your top three choices. Well, I put the Jets in there. Um, they're going to have maybe 90, 95 million in cap run, depending upon who they cut. Uh, I think Cleveland's a leverage play that if they're interested, he's going to keep them in to try to drive up the price to where he wants to go. The interesting thing is going to be does Minnesota make a push for him? Because if I'm him and Minnesota makes a push, and the money is in the same ballpark. I might actually take a little le- less. The money has to be in the same ballpark as the other offers, though. It can't be apples and oranges. To go to a team which is ready-made, and the Broncos would be the other team. Um, they've got a ready-made defense. Uh, I would want them to keep the two receivers, not cut either Emmanuel Sanders or Demarius Thomas. It doesn't hurt that he played really well against Denver this year because – times you see when a player has a good game against a team that has a need in his position and he's going to be a free agent but that team pursues him and i say that from personal experience i used to help represent um eric allen um who's like a six seven time pro bowler um when he was with the eagles uh over like a two three year span he returned three interceptions for touchdowns against the saints when it, when he became a free agent he went to the Saints. They remembered that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you reminded them of that, uh, too, in case they forgot. <laughs> hey, Joel, let's oh, th- they knew what they were getting with Eric, because <laughs> at the time, the corners that you had, Deion Sanders, Rod Woodson, Daryl Green, Aeneas Williams, and Eric were all in that same pretty much conversation. Hey, Joe, let's stick with this whole franchise tag discussion in terms of Cousins because, uh, you, you know, we've seen some, some decent names be tagged and play out their tags, and, and now we're seeing sort of a, a resemblance of, of back-to-backs coming to focus here, right? We're, we're at a situation where Tremaine Johnson just finished two in L.A. and Le'Veon Bell maybe is, is headed for his second right now. Where, where is this going? You know, this doesn't seem to benefit anybody, really. I mean, I mean obviously the player's happy to have a decent salary for one season, and to have it guaranteed, but you know, you know, is this a trend that's going somewhere? Are teams abusing this in terms of how this is working, or is this just this is how it is, and this is how the CBA is written, and this is what we're going to see with big players until something gets fixed? Well, what looked to be a mistake was the change in how the methodology methodology of calculating franchise tags uh, was it looked to be a mistake that you changed it from just the average of the top five players from the prior year and made it over a five-year period, tying it to the percentage of the cap because the first couple of years, the numbers rolled back. Now with the cap growth being basically 8% per year over the past couple of years, these numbers are starting to get to be really high that you're only going to see maybe a handful of guys franchise, five to no more than seven. You're not going to see 15, 20 uh, like you did in 2012. Um, the thing is, the franchise tag has lost its true intent. It was really to keep a true franchise player. It wasn't to restrict your best guy who's going to be a free agent. I think what Kirk Cousins has done uh, is he's kind of given players something new to think about. That As the numbers continue to grow, and it's a 20% increase the second time, and then the third one is if you're not a quarterback, it's going to be – uh, 44% raise of the highest franchise tag number, which would be quarterback for most other for most players at other positions. That the franchise tag becomes your friend. You're playing on uh, high price one year prove it deals, but odds are you won't get the third franchise tag. So you can be one of the highest paid players at your position over the two year period, like Jermaine Johnson, the only cornerback to make more over the last two years, is Josh Norman. Then hit the open market. Um, Vivian Bell is an interesting situation to me because he turned down what would have easily been the highest paid running back deal, but it wasn't enough for him for a couple of reasons. One, he thinks he should be paid like a second receiver and a running back because of his receiving skills. And two, 
the running back market has really decreased since his heyday in 2011, 12, 13, when he had Adrian Peterson in a deal on a deal averaging more than 14 million, 14 million per year. Chris Johnson at like 13.5. So he wants to drive the market up from those deals. I would just stick the franchise tag on him a second time, give him 500 touches, and go from there. Uh, that that would be the way I would do it. I wouldn't give him a long term deal. I'd run him into the ground and let him um, be somebody else's problem in 2019 and beyond. All right. So on uh, maybe somewhere down the road, Le'Veon's name would be on the list that I'm going to ask you about now, Joel. Which is between now and the start of the NFL season in mid March, we'll, we'll talk an awful lot about guys signing, but there's going to be guys that are going to get cut too. Um, any big names that you foresee as potentially being cap casualties over the next couple of weeks? Uh, yeah, there are probably going to be plenty of guys who uh, in, end up getting released. Um, maybe Des Bryant. He already said he doesn't want to take a pay cut, um, but he hasn't been producing the way you would expect him to produce um, ever since he signed the big deal. Uh, you could see one of the receivers in um, Denver uh, be gone. Um, either Demarius Thomas or Emmanuel Sanders. That wouldn't necessarily help you in your any pursuit of uh, Kirk Cousins. Um, let's see. Who else are you probably going to – oh, Muhammad Wilkerson. That's pretty much a given. Mm-hmm. That he hasn't uh, performed to the, the contract that he signed, which uh, made him one of the highest-paid uh, non-quarterbacks. So I can't see him sticking around um, in 2018 either. We already saw Darrell Revis isn't going to be around in Kansas City for another year. Um, Adrian Peterson seems like he's going to be a cap casualty in Arizona. His best days are long behind him. Hey, Joe, what about that Seahawks defense? There's a, there's a lot of rising cap numbers. There's a lot of injuries, too. It's really kind of an interesting situation because – you know they don't seem ready to kind of turn turn over and become you know rebuilders at this point based on you know their production has been pretty good still and they're winning games, but th- th- there's there's a lot of dead contracts on that defense and you know actually a lot of them just got guaranteed in terms of their salaries. But where do you see the next couple of weeks with the Seahawks defense going? Yeah, they went all in this past season by trading for Sheldon Richardson, giving up a second round pick in um, Jermaine Curse, then trading for. Um, Dwayne Brown, so they finally were paying an offensive lineman. And they missed the playoffs for the first time since they uh, drafted Russell Wilson. They're kind of in a, a team in transition. Um, Cliff Averill's career is probably over uh, because of the neck injury. He's going to get released most likely at some point in time. Uh, Michael Bennett doesn't think he's going to be back, even though if they do cut him, they've essentially given him $8.5 million dollars for no additional year since this would be the first year of his extension. Uh, Richard Sherman's an interesting case, the torn Achilles. He probably wasn't going to be in the long-term plans anyway since they were reportedly shopping him around the draft last year. Uh, I'd come to him and ask him to take a pay cut. He's now representing himself, so that's a new dynamic mm. that they have to deal with. Uh, it uh, Give him the chance to make the $11 million he's supposed to make, put some of it in incentives, others in per game roster bonuses. That's what I try to do if I'm the team. And Earl Thomas, um, for some reason, decided to throw out the whole card before we'd even finish the playoffs. So <laughs> this is going to be a team in transition. Jimmy Graham's probably not going to be back uh, at tight end unless the market bottoms out for him. Uh, maybe they – find a way to put a franchise tag on Sheldon Richardson, given what they gave up for him. But the Legion of Boom isn't going to be the Legion of Boom much longer. Because When they did the deal for Cam Chancellor, which didn't make a lot of sense for me, to me, because when you get a game of $12 million for your contract, you set a floor for if you're ever going to do something with Earl Thomas. And now the unfortunate, potentially currenting injury he puts them in a precarious position cap-wise because there's no good options with Cam Chancellor because now it's 2018 salaries guaranteed. You may have the injury guarantee from 2019 at $5.2 million kick in. So it's probably better just to carry him, and if he has to stay, start the season or stay on PUP, do that and worry about him in 2019. 
Joe, we could keep you for another uh, 50 minutes if we wanted to and beyond with all the things there. But uh, we'll leave one final question. And uh, you talk about the bottom falling out. Do you ever see – are are we going to hit a crash – um, in particular, the NBA, a uh, little experience with the NBA there. They only got 40 million series per year and still rising uh, next year uh, in the landscape of the NBA. Do you ever see things falling out like uh, you see in a stock market sometimes where just these salaries can't continue to escalate the way they do? Well, the smart thing that the NFL did the NBA didn't do is they gradually phased in the TV money, so you didn't have that – Big spike in one year, like you had in the NBA, going from seventy million to over ninety million in the cap, and now the cap is barely increasing. The NFL, you you didn't see that, so you're going to continue to have eight percent increases. The only thing where you're going to see potentially a problem is if media rights ever decrease. They haven't, and the TV contracts, media rights are really the lifeblood of any sport that has a salary cap. Uh, we saw that Fox is paying more for the Thursday night package than what was before. And I'd imagine when the TV contract well, after the CBA expires in 2020, I think 2022 is the year most of them are up, that you're going to probably have the NFL find a way to really monetize digital streaming, maybe through an Amazon Prime, a YouTube, Facebook, someone like that in ways where there's going to be more money for all the rights paid than before. So you're going to see revenues continue to grow despite declining ratings, and salaries continue to escalate. If you ever see those fees drop, that's when there's real trouble. Hey, Joe, what about guarantees with those salaries? Are, are we getting closer? Are we getting you know farther away? Is there ever going to be language put in that basically says veterans will have guaranteed salaries no matter? Uh, not in the CBA because not in the, it's in the CBA for salary guarantee date um, during the season for basketball players. But the biggest impediment to me is this archaic rule where you have to fund into escrow uh, skill and cap guarantees. So why is an owner going to want to tie up all that money, giving someone a fully guaranteed contract uh, if you? If the union makes that a priority and gets that out, I think that will pave the way for more, for a fully guaranteed contract. You're also going to need a player to exploit his leverage mm-hmm. in order to do that. You have it with the first 20 rookie deals in the draft, but you haven't seen a veteran do that yet. Maybe Cousins, if he can't get the money he wants or he's going to reshape or reset the market, he tries to get a fully guaranteed contract. First, got to start getting guys to get guarantees in the years which – are a risk to the team, which would be years four and five in a contract. At least a partial guarantee is going to be the first step. The first two, three years, well, actually first two, three for the huge deals, are the low-risk years for a team. So I think the incremental step may be getting partial guarantee in years four and year five of a long-term deal before we get to the fully guaranteed contract, unless some player who has a ton of leverage fully exploits it. Joel, thank you so much for the time and all the knowledge, and we hope to have you on again, and we want to make sure everybody follows you at Corey Joel on Twitter. Thanks again for your time. Sure. Thanks for having me. Time now for the contract of the week. Well, Mike, uh, it certainly was a very interesting signing in uh, to really kind of get sort of the offseason kicked off, and that was the deal that Jimmy Garoppolo signed with the San Francisco 49ers late last week. A ton of money, uh, a lot of it up front, which I thought was really interesting the way the Niners went about doing it. You know, I know there's been some backlash from some people about, oh, he only has seven or eight career starts. How could you give him this money? I mean, anybody that watched him play in San Francisco knows he's going to be great, and you didn't have any choice to He's a free agent. You're looking at a franchise tag or a deal. I thought the Niners did a lot of good things with that contract. Yeah, I think I think not having a choice is exactly right. Right? They 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 paid for their guy. They they sent the second round pick. This was going to be their guy. I'm a little surprised they didn't at least franchise tag him and let things ride out a little bit. Just because there's going to be such a movement with quarterbacks, right? You're going to see a Cousins deal. You're going to see possibly a Matt Ryan extension. You would have had some numbers to sort of base it off of. But they just said, screw it, we've got money. We're going to make it next man up, right? We're going to make him, you know, the next highest average paid player in the league, and that's just how it's going to be. And, yeah, I was fully expecting it, it to be structured this way. 
this is a massive first year salary. What, what we have here is we've got $42.6 million in 2018, which is a record, which is silly based on the structure. But they can But not do it. silly based on their salary That's cap right. of over $100 million available. Right. Their adjusted salary cap is going to be somewhere around $230 million when you talk about rollover money, this year's cap, and the players they'll have signed. So they're going to be heading the march with a ton of cap, hundred, about $90 million now in terms of how things are structured. But the way they did this Garoppolo deal is they said – You'll have a six million dollar salary this year, to, which is essentially his annual pay, his biweekly paycheck, right? And they're giving him a twenty eight million dollar roster bonus, which all comes into 2018's cap, which sounds crazy for a lot of teams, but for the 49ers, they could handle it. So why not do it this way, right? Why not take it front loaded, so that the rest of the cap really stays low, like like, like we just had Joel talk about. Years four and years five are really tenable in terms of 2021 and 2022. But let, let's be honest here. Let's talk about what this contract really is, right? Because as I've said before, a five-year contract in the NFL is never a five-year contract. So the way they structured this with all that money in the first year and then a little bit of money in the second year, they're easily out of this contract after two years if they want to be. I mean, they're saving themselves almost $8 million by cutting him after 2019 if they need to. They're, they're in a great position the dead cap falls completely off because the signing bonus is minimal, right? I mean, you're at a situation where there's only a $7 million signing bonus going around here. So the dead cap down the line is easy. They can move money around if they need to. And look, if this is their quarterback, he's going to be complaining about the cash flow come, you know, year three and year four. So this is going to be a short-term deal. The, 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 the situation was let's lock him in. Let's make him very happy, obviously, in the year one. He'll be happy in year two. We'll see where we are in year three because we can get out or we can make move some money around and restructure if we need to. But this is a wonderfully team-friendly deal based on the cap situation the 49ers were here. It, teams are rarely in the position to have over $100 million in cap space. But if every team was, isn't this exactly the kind of deal that every team would want to do? Because you're not locked into some crazy amount of money on the back end when the player may be aging, aging out, or you may not be able to handle it and thus have to make a decision to renegotiate or cut. This was brilliant, I thought, on San Francisco's part, which was we got all this cap we're never going to use all of it even if we signed every superstar available so let's just throw it at him and make our lives easier down the road and, and it's not a coincidence that his 46 million this year is exactly double what the franchise tag would have been right i mean that that's essentially what they did right they these minds got together and said well we can franchise tag you for 23 or we can double that and pay that you pay that all to you this year and put you in a five-year deal and who knows from there right so yeah it's it's good business by them I hope the Browns do something similar, whether that's with Kirk Cousins or with some other major position that they need to fill. Um, you know, they've obviously got cap to burn. Don't let this thing roll over every year like you know, like they've been doing. Couldn't they offer Cousins fifty million in the first year? No, no question. Yeah, no question. They Maybe could, that's they, what it would take to the, get him. Oh, it absolutely. With Garoppolo's numbers, that is what it will take now. Right. So that's the, as we talked about the you know in our feature here. Yeah, Cousins' numbers will have to exceed Garoppolo's for sure. I, I think he's more in line with where's Matt Ryan and Aaron Rodgers going in terms of their next contract. So there's Boy, a, lot, that, that, a lot to be that, shelled out here. I get <laughs> it. It still blows me away, Kevin, to think that that you're going to, in any conversation, comparing Kirk Cousins to Aaron Rodgers and Matt Ryan. Yep. Yeah, I boy, I'm just yeah. You're not. thinking playoff wins. That's well, all. I'm uh, thinking but, what I see on the field. I know you're think you're coming at it from a contractual standpoint and availability, not, right? Not Supply even though, and demand. not even though the numbers are there. I mean, we do. I do. I do my valuations on Cousins. I can't get him to Aaron Rodgers' valuation. So I'll be. I'll be frank there. But he's worth twenty six million in terms of just his production. I just don't know that you, you I don't know you'll find a <laughs> oh. single football fan who would tell you Kirk Cousins is as good as Aaron well, Rodgers in any way, shape, or form. His mom would. <laughs> right? And I'm sure she likes Maybe. football. <laughs> hey, I, I, I love deals, right? Yeah. So I, I want to get value in deals and I look at a position. Um, it's not a quarterback position. Obviously. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to deal with somebody and I and I want a position that's huge. And you look at the Super Bowl teams, and the one team has the best guy in the league, and the other, perhaps the second best, who made the big play. And I'm talking about tight ends. And I want to talk about Jimmy Graham. Yeah. And he's a free agent, Jimmy Graham. He's 31. Used to be great. Used to be. Well, what the heck happened to Jimmy Graham? And do you think you can get a deal by signing Jimmy Graham to be a free agent tight end? 
Uh, yes, I think he will. I don't think he's worth the twelve million he's asking for. I don't even think he's worth the ten Hasn't million been he that had kind last of year. Player in the last couple of years. Is it him or is it his system? Well, I think that's what a lot I mean, of people are saying. He leaves Drew Brees in New Orleans, and he's not the same player again. That's right. But he's been hurt too. He's battled some injuries. The knee injury a couple of years ago, I think, was a big factor. You need, yeah. But the teams, the successful teams, they have a great threat at tight end. They do, and. I mean, look what Ertz did for the Philadelphia Eagles, right? And you look at what uh, Gronk does for the, well, the New England let, Patriots. Let's stay there, Kevin, because okay. we've got a situation where I think Dwayne Allen is getting released in New England, Martellus Bennett is getting released in New England, and Rob Gronkowski possibly is retiring in New England. So if you're going to ask me where Jimmy Graham's going to end up, I think the conversation is over right yeah, there. It's yeah. New England. What's yeah. the impact okay. if Gronk walks away? It's minimal. It's about $4 million in dead cap. They're going to save money. They're going to be able to afford Jimmy Graham with, with Gronk savings right off the bat in terms of this year. So if all signs keep pointing in that direction in terms of Gronkowski in 2018, that's exactly right, put Jimmy Graham. Uh, let me throw some other, something else at you, and it's related to something we talked about with Joel Corey. As we were sort of sitting here, there was a report uh, from NFL, from an NFL media type that the Broncos are looking to trade Emmanuel Sanders. So, And his name came up in relation to Demarius Thomas and Sanders are due a lot of money, but how could Denver let any of those guys get away if you're trying to lure Kirk Cousins? Yeah, we've been saying this for the last few weeks now, haven't we, that these guys are sort of the the outliers in terms of these cap casualties, and if that's the case, you know why would Cousins want to go and play with a couple of rookies? Uh, I still think that's the direction they're going to go. De- Demarius Thomas has an option bonus coming up here in the next few days. Uh, he's his production's been low, his injuries have been prone. I mean, he's he's a, in a situation where he's certainly not worth the top dollar they gave him. You know he, that fell off after the first year of that contract. So it's a dead Bryant situation where they just don't don't probably can't be paying that kind of cash to him. But if they had to pick between him and Emmanuel Sanders, my guess is they take Demarius Thomas for another year. Uh, is Emmanuel Sanders tradable is the question. Emmanuel Sanders has had mm. a major drop-off in production the past two seasons. And even if they're trading for him, you're getting salaries of $8.25 million and $10.25 million. Obviously, you can restructure that. You know That's not guaranteed money. But you're, you're looking at a guy who, who right now was worth $18.5 million over two years. You know, production. Yeah, well, he went from not, Peyton yeah. Manning to Trevor Simeon as quarterback too, right? He did. He did, and it's another question. It's the same situation. Is, is he in a system that's just not producing for him? Uh, he's overpaid right now in terms of his salaries going over the next two years. So I, I think contractually, either whether it's with Denver or with another team, that's going to have to change. Uh, but certainly, I think moving on from him in one way or another outside of Demarius Thomas is the way to go. All right, I just I got to ask you about one more contract, but it's not football. Sure. Um, because you're a baseball guy, I want to ask you what you thought of. Well, and also you're, you're a Mets fan too. Hmm. What'd you think of their move? Right, he wasn't the guy I was going to ask you about. What would you think of their move with the Frazier? Uh, I'm not a Frazier fan, <laughs> but I am a fan of. I having like a the third TV. Baseman. I like the TV show. Yeah, I wasn't. Uh, I'm a Met fan. I wasn't uh, like blown away. No, uh, but, by it, but I was worried that they have no second baseman or third baseman <laughs> heading into spring training. So I guess this fills a hole. You Darvish though, and you probably figured that was the guy I was going to ask you about, right? Yeah. Uh, this is exactly where I had you, Darvish, valued. I had him at $21.9 million per year. So the fact that you know this waiting game has happened and he's down to a $21 million per year contract. With the Cubs, by the way, in case you didn't look at, follow it. It's still surprising. When I value a player at $21.9 million, that's their baseline value, right? That's sure. not their free agent value. Everybody overpays in free agency. That's just how this works, except for this year, of course, where nobody's getting paid in free agency. I, I like the deal. I like the, I like the team. That's a really nice rotation for them right now. Um, my question looking at Darvish is, what now with Arietta? Because Arietta is yeah. the same age, but he's had less injuries. He's had less intensive work on that arm over the year. He's got less production on that arm. Uh, he's a better. He's just a better pitcher, right? I mean, he's valuing up near twenty six, twenty seven million in terms of you know he's up in Kershaw numbers and Scherzer numbers in terms of where he values. Uh, I'm worried that we're just in a situation now where teams aren't willing to pay that kind of money. I mean, we've got the best hitter, J.D. Martinez, reportedly feeling $20 million op- offers when he's a $30 million bat. So um, this just makes me think, where are we going now with Arietta? And that's uh, hopefully we'll find out in the next week or so. All right. Great stuff. You can follow it all, SpotTrack.com. Every contract's on there. You can look at the market valuations. Uh, that's a, a new thing they have with the NFL, too, if you really want to look at the market value uh, based upon the SpotTrack formula, proprietary formula there. It's up there, SpotTrack.com. Mike, thank you. 
Joel, who's not with us anymore, but thank you for earlier, Joel. Yeah, he's a great follow on Twitter. Uh, mm-hmm. he really, if you want, if you want the, the kind of insight that you need to have that Mike provides us when these contracts get done, Joel's the guy as well there too. Paul, thank you. Always a pleasure. And me, thank me. Okay, uh, thanks for listening to SpotTrack.com podcast for Mike and Paul Peck. I'm Kevin Sebastian. Thanks for listening.